Are we ready to get started? What do you think, Julie? Yeah. Well, yeah. good afternoon. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Thank you for joining us for this two-hour scoping session to identify priorities on climate, environment, and health across the Americas. My name is Anna Stewart Ibarra. I'm the science director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. And I'm gonna pass the floor to Nicole Arbor, the executive director of the Belmont Forum for some words of welcome. Nicole. Hello everybody. It's great to see so many participants joining us today for the Climate, Environment and Health Scoping Workshop. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all and to be able to see so many um, new faces joining us I don't know if, uh, how many of you are here for the first time at the scoping session, if this is your first one or if this is your old hat, but we love to have as many of you joining us as possible. Um, as you know, this is a regional scoping meeting, so we're particularly looking forward to uh, hearing from our stakeholders in Latin America and the Caribbean, but of course, everybody else who's joined us as well. So uh, welcome, and we look forward to an excellent conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I'd also like to introduce Anna Watson, who has been doing a fantastic job organizing and leading this event. Anna, she's gonna help us with some housekeeping and, and getting us going this afternoon. Thank you. Um, bienvenidos a todos. Voy a cambiar el español. Quería uh, hacerles unas recomendaciones para nuestra reunión hoy. Um, primero, les voy a pedir que por favor mantengan siempre el nombre de, su nombre a la vista. Um, perdón, ahora soy yo la que tiene un problema con la presentación. Ay. Por favor, si pueden mantener su nombre, vamos a tener la sesión en español y en inglés con un intérprete simultáneo y vamos a tener una sesión de grupos y los grupos los vamos a organizar de acuerdo a su idioma preferido. Les voy a pedir que por favor se renombre usando las letras E, N, G y su nombre y su apellido en el caso de que su idioma sea inglés. Eh, si su idioma es español, por favor usen S, P, A y su nombre y su apellido. Y si son bilingües y no tienen preferencia entre el inglés o el español, por favor usen la opción ENG y SPA. El procedimiento para poder hacer este renombre es ir a la parte inferior donde dice participantes, luego seleccionar eh, la opción que diga más o more, dependiendo de cómo tengan configurado su Zoom link. Y luego, por favor, eh, la opción rename y ahí pueden cambiar su nombre. Les pedimos esto al inicio de la sesión para poder atenderlos mejor y comunicarnos de acuerdo a su lenguaje preferido y como les mencionaba, para poder asignarlos en la charla de, de, del taller que va a ser grupal en base a su idioma. Adicionalmente, recordarles que tenemos interpretación durante el evento en español en inglés eh, a través de Soledad. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Ana. Eh... ¿Quieres seguir con el link de Slido? There you go. Sí, lo pudieron ver. Just for a minute and then it came down again. Entonces, para la primera parte, les vamos a pedir que por favor nos digan en el slide eh, cuál es la primera pregunta que se les, la primera palabra que se les viene a la mente cuando escuchan clima, medio ambiente y salud. La idea es que esta sea una sesión interactiva. Pueden unirse a través de slido.com con el código 
1-2-2-4-4-2 o pueden con el celular tomar la foto al código QR que están viendo en pantalla y así participar de, de la sesión y enviarnos las preguntas. Eh, vamos a poder ver los resultados en vivo y ver cómo, eh, cuál es el feedback de, de todos los participantes. Desastres, diarrea, inequidad, colaboración interdisciplinaria, ambiente, una salud, vector borne disease, well being, heat, resilience, resiliencia. Adaptaciones. Parece que inequality es la que está dominando. Heat. Si yo estoy en Alberta, en Canadá, y puedo decir que este verano ha sido muy caliente. <ríe> muy caliente. Bueno, podemos ir viendo que hay diferentes ideas o perspectivas para entender el nexo entre clima, medio ambiente y salud en nuestra región y lo que más nos preocupa. Y es justamente por eso que queremos tener este taller, porque la idea es conversar sobre estas diferentes perspectivas y escenarios y lograr entender un, en base a un consenso eh, cómo, cómo se pueden plantear y mejorar los approaches o los enfoques al, al nexo de clima, medio ambiente y salud con una mirada más holística. Y de, en base a las necesidades de la región. No, le doy la palabra a Julie, que va a darnos una pequeña presentación sobre nuestra sesión el día de hoy. All right. So, um, thank you very much, Ana and Ana and Nicole. Um, and thanks to all of you for showing up here today and um, sticking with us for the next couple of hours. M my name is Julie Turton. I'm with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. And I am the One Health and Integrated Climate Research Lead there. Uh, that doesn't mean a whole lot um, necessarily, except that my job in our agency, which has met uh, services, climate services, ocean service, fishery service, is to coordinate the engagement and the provision of services, data, and tools for the health community and with the health community. And in that regard, I lead a few interagency programs. One of them is with the U.S. Global Change Research Program. I lead their Climate Change and Human Health Working Group, along with my colleague, John Balbus from the National Institutes of Health um, and Paul Schramm from the Centers for Disease Control. And the enterprise of the U.S. Global Change Research Program is very supportive of Belmont Forum. Um, the International Working Group actually leads the Belmont Forum. And so I am in this role today leading um, along with a team of folks from the U.S. Global Change Research Program who are on this call, along with IAI, Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, also on this call, and a host of others, a team planning this next round of climate, environment, and health funding. Um, and that's what we're doing here today. So I can't tell you how many people are behind this call and how many phone calls and meetings and technical support um, from Amerigeo itself to Belmont Forum itself, to the U.S. Global Change Research Program, to the Inter-American Institute for uh, Global Change Research. Uh, it has been a, a huge team to get us this far, but now it's up to you guys. Um, so our job today is to give you a little background on what the Belmont Forum is, and more importantly, this climate environment and health call, and really to hear from you through these breakouts and you know during the, during the rest of the session here, what you think the priorities are for this um, field of research and help us find the right partners on the research side and the funding side. So you hear more about that. Anyway, that's what I'm doing here. Again, my name is Julie Turton and I am so honored to be uh, helping guide us through this session today. And so that I can see people and see the chat, Anna um, Stewart is gonna actually change the slides for me. So Anna, please, please go ahead. Um, 
All right, so I think we went through a little bit, but basically we've already had our open and interview and, and I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a presentation for you. And then we're gonna hear from Daniel Buss, who I'll introduce in a minute. We're gonna go to the breakout sessions and then do um, a little bit of a five minute uh, regroup where you'll come back into plenary. We'll have a short debrief and then give you some tasks and actions for moving forward onto the next steps and ways that you can engage with us and that we can engage with you. Okay, next slide. So to start out, um, you know, Belmont Forum was really designed in 2009 to tackle these big problems. So this is a little, this is the Belmont Forum portion of the, of the session. So what is Belmont Forum? Um, and I know it coming in through climate, environment, health, but I love what it's all about because it's really about tackling these big global problems that require um, multiple disciplines. There are issues that can't be tackled within one country or within, within one community or by one sector by itself. They are involving both human, social, and physical science. They are stakeholder driven, really trying to do great science, but so that it can be used and taken up. So it's got a very um, stakeholder driven focus and stakeholder engagement component that's necessary and even required. And, um, and this time around, the, well, actually a couple of years ago, Belmont Forum um, decided that they, next slide please, that they were going to add to their repertoire. So they've been funding work at the interface of disaster resilience, more on the physical science side of things and the biological science, the National Science Foundation type of things, um, but really innovative work. Uh, disaster, you can see this little word cloud of the type of things that they funded. And you'll see in here, climate, environment, health. It's small, but it's relatively new. So they have a history of funding these cross-disciplinary kinds of programs, transdisciplinary science. It's required to be competitive, to do to, to be funded through Belmont Forum. And you have to have at least three countries that are Belmont Forum members. So it is big problems, cross sectors, cross institutions, cross nations. Those are, are the big issues. And really um, transdisciplinary is a requirement for all of the, all the work that they fund. Next slide, please. Um, they fund through the scoping process, which is much like what we're doing here today, but the main countries that are members of Belmont Forum, um, there are 29 at the moment. There have been upwards of uh, you know, fewer and of course a uh, few more, but it, it generally hovers around 30. And in order to be at the table in Belmont Forum discussions, you have to be a Belmont Forum member. But you do not have to be a Belmont Forum member per se to participate in a particular call. So I'll explain that a little bit more later. But let's so say this last round of funding, NOAA is actually not the official U.S. government Belmont Forum member. That's the National Science Foundation. But several parts of the U.S. government came to the table for this particular call. And we were able to do that because NSF is a Belmont Forum member and we, we came to the table collectively. So first of all, think innovatively. There may be official Belmont Forum members, but we want to make sure that, that, that there are many, many ways for people to actually be um, engaged. Okay. Next one is all the partners. So this gets to the point I was just making. Um, the partners for all of these calls, collaborative research actions are called, um, are varied and depend on the stakeholder community, the funding community, and, and not necessarily even federal funders. I mean, in our work on the climate, environment, and health, we're actually working with private sector and you know banks and other institutions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I can't even count all of the other partners here, but I know in, in CEH, uh, Climate, Environment, and Health, the first round, we had um, 13 organizations and nine countries. And that was just, that's what we ended up with in the scoping process. We probably had, you know, 25 or 30 more. So, all right, next slide, please. So why, um, so Belmont Forum, a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago now in Brazil had their annual meeting, uh, was presented with the opportunity or the idea um, through a group called Future Earth and their Health Knowledge Action Network and presented this idea of doing a focused funding effort on climate environment and health to the Belmont Forum membership. And they said, yeah, this is a big problem. We don't have great connections with the health community, but we certainly do have the physical and the biological and the modeling and the transdisciplinary nature. We were just a little weak on the health side. So 
they were very interested and willing to bridge that gap. And so part of it was to really uh, tackle some of these problems that had been studied well, but not comprehensively. So pockets here and they're really trying to coordinate the funding approach, the community and the like to really get to this transdisciplinary problem that made sure we provide information, useful information to decision makers, improved understanding of the risks, the causal pathways, behavioral um, behaviors and vulnerabilities across time scales. Okay, so not just, you know, right here and now, but long term as well. Um, develop prediction early warning systems, really stimulate innovative solutions. So that creative part, the innovative challenge part, the different way of doing things, the combination of art and science, all kinds of things at the innovation space. And then this last one here, facilitate new and sustained partnerships. That means between health practitioners, ministries of health, ministries of environment, met services, academic community. And it also means with different banks and funders and non-governmental organizations working in this space. So we really mean a very broad definition of uh, in new and sustained partnerships. Next slide, please. That was one of the main goals of the Climate, Environment, and Health call. It was always intended to be multi-year and have an explicit goal of building this community um, very broadly. All right, so I think I mentioned this already, but we had, for the first round of Climate, Environment, and Health, we received um, 59 proposals, funded nine projects, supported 69 researchers from 20 countries. There was a long process through the scoping process, and you'll see down at the bottom, the three focus areas that were decided on in part because they were science priorities and quite frankly, in part because that's what people can fund. So I want you to hear clearly it's what are the science priorities and who can fund what? So there's two parts to this equation here. Um, we focused on climate sensitive diseases, heat and health and food systems and nutrition. There was a whole host of things on which we could have focused, but this is where we chose to start knowing two things. That's what our funders could fund at that time. And also we'd be um, at this again now, which is where we are. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of some of the projects and you'll see the color coding is, you know, they're not, they're not all like, I guess the ones in, in purple are more square on just heat and health, but the other ones have a bit of crossover here, um, just to give you a sense of, of where they are and what, what they're working on, a good cross section. And I will say, and you'll hear this repeatedly, we, you know, Belmont Forum is really flexible and each of the funding and contributing organizations can actually uh, write its own annex of how it wants to work and um, uh, who it can fund and what it can fund. And so the real goal here for this call today and the scoping effort is to identify some of the barriers and obstacles, science and institutional, and then to bring the communities together, both the science community that would apply and use the information and the funding group. Because if there isn't money to fund people in your country, then it can't get funded. I mean, it's a simple that. <laughs> so we had as a call, out in our first round, uh, specifically to support low and middle income, income countries. But we, we actually didn't have the institutions at the table to fund them in the way that we wanted to. So we're really, really happy to be talking with you while we're taking more of a regional approach, hoping that you can help us with both sides of that coin. What are the really most pressing issues that we should be addressing in this comprehensive transdisciplinary way? And where are the other partners and how can we work with them to make sure that that people in your region can actually get funded once they apply. So um, next slide. All right, so what we're doing here is part of what we're doing here today, um, consulting with all of you. Uh, really just taking, we decided to take a regional approach to do with our scoping so we could really focus in on priorities for the region and network for the stakeholders as well, institutional as well as academic and research. Um, developing innovative partnerships. I think I mentioned that already. And then again, working with the international organizations to build a funding collaboration. You know, even if it's not sharing resources, you don't have to necessarily pool your money. In fact, Belmont Forum doesn't pool money. Everybody keeps their own, but leveraging each other, working together um, to make sure that, that we know who's funding and that we can build on each other's work and leverage where appropriate, share where appropriate, you know, resources and capacity. So that, um, that in kind or, um, financial resource and stakeholder engagement um, are both really important in this uh, second round of climate, environment, and health. Next slide. All right, so I am going to just run, I've got one or two more slides, but just where are we in the process? Well, here we are at the scoping. 
Um, we are, this is the first regional scoping event. We've done a kickoff with the Belmont Forum members that were involved in, in the first round of climate, environment, and health, and some of the core partners that are considering participating. Um, but this is our first official regional scoping event. So for better or worse, you are, are, are the, the first ones out of the box, and, um, but very well organized and very well um, attended here. So we're, we're very happy to be having this conversation with you. The next step, we'll do a region uh, focus, a scoping exercise in Asia Pacific. We'll do an exercise like this in Africa and Europe. So there are two more at least, possibly a third one on islands, depending on the timing. But the point is to know by late September, mid-October, by the end of October and the Belmont Forum annual meeting, sort of who's on board, what our primary focus areas are. And then after we get the, the final call in and some draft text written, then between the Belmont Forum annual meeting in um, October, early November, we actually finish writing the call text. The call opens in January, 2022, if all goes as planned. Um, there's a process for pre-proposals and everything that allows some time for teams to get together. IAI is uh, probably gonna be doing some um, capacity building and training in this regard as well. Final proposals will be due ideally in September. We'll do the review process um, in, and that will be done in February. So almost, you know, it seems like quite a long time, but we want to allow enough time for the teams to work together and for a thorough review. And then awards made in 2023. Now this is a draft timeline because we can work uh, very flexibly with different funding schedules and fiscal years. We've crossed a couple of fiscal years in the last go round. I have nothing to think that we wouldn't be doing that again. So this is a notional timeline. It can move forward or back depending on those interested in funding. Probably not a whole lot more forward, but it could, could, could be a little bit more forward. So um, that's the general time frame, and that's what we're doing. So over the next month, we'll be doing, well, month and a half, we'll be doing an Asia Pacific scoping and one in Africa and maybe a, another one just in small islands, but that one hasn't been set yet. Okay, so next slide, please. All right. Um, so what we're going to do after I'm finished is um, go into some breakouts, but I'm going to just get this in, in set in your head for a second. And then we're going to hear from our, um, our PAHO colleague, Pan American Health Organization colleague. So the whole point of this and what you're going to do after the Daniel's talk here is to think about what are the most critical obstacles to using environmental and climate information. And those can be institutional barriers, they can be scientific barriers, they can be operational barriers, just what is it that's actually preventing us from really using this um, environmental information more functionally to manage health risks or to reduce them in the long run? Um, how do we develop a more integrated community and co-create actionable information? And then again, the new contributors, both funding in kind, the partnerships across um, academic institutions and disciplines. And then at the end, um, IAI is actually going to to put together a roadmap for the Americas and that white paper will actually be used to, to help define the scope and the shape of the climate environment and health call. Okay, so next slide, I believe that should be, should be it. Yeah, so I think at this point, can you just go back up to the other one? Um, I, I want now to just pause for a moment and again, thank you all for your attention and, and introduce our next speaker, which is really gonna set the tone because all this talk about, we wanna have a better connection with the health community. Well, let me just say the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization in general have been really supportive and engaged with us. And we are thrilled to have Dr. Daniel Buss from the Pan American Health Organization. He's their climate and health advisor. Um, he's a part of a steering group and has been very interested in helping us shape this climate environment health work. They've been doing a tremendous amount of work with the ministers of health throughout the Americas on what the important issues are for CEH. And so uh, without further ado, I think Daniel has spent uh, much of his time in Brazil and is now officially up, uh, as a part of Pan American Health Organization in DC. Although we are co-located, I don't see him because we're not moving around very much anymore. But um, Dr. Booth, I would like to turn it over to you. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us and your insights. And I think, Daniel, if you can do your screen share, that's the next move. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Julie. Thanks a lot. 
colleagues for um, for having me here today. Let's see if I learned well how to share that. Is that working? <laughs> we did some testing before. I hope that it's it's Looks working. Looks great. Well. Looks great. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> A fast learner, you can see. But thanks for the, the teachers. So, uh, no, thanks a lot um, for having us here. Uh, PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, for those that uh, you might probably don't know, or just to remind you that we are the <coughs> regional office for the World Health Organization for the Americas. We are based in Washington, D.C. as the headquarters, but we do have, oops, we do have offices in virtually all the countries in the Americas and uh, sub-regional offices as well. So we do work closely with ministers of health and other ministries in, in, in the topics of um, health and climate change or climate change and health, depending on the perspective that you look at. So uh, I'll just go through some of the main <clears throat> problems or, or, or you know connections between climate change and health in the Americas. I'm not, not going to spend a lot of time here because I'm I think that most of you, I, I can recognize many of the names from colleagues from countries um, in the Americas, but uh, we do have uh, a large number of problems to tackle in the region. It's a very uh, diverse and culturally diverse and, um, and also environmentally diverse region that brings us a lot of challenges to work on. Um, from hurricanes in Central America and the Caribbean to sea level rise in this region as well, with uh, multiple uh, disasters happening in this region uh, recently, even hurricanes hitting the US and, and other countries in, in, in the past few weeks. Um, landslides and mudslides in virtually all the region, but very severe ones in the West Coast of South America a few years ago. Flooding and droughts um, happening in many countries as well, uh, the dry corridor in Central America, but also the Northeast part in Brazil, and even some parts of the uh, Southern Cone, um, with impacts on the most vulnerable people, uh, indigenous populations, for example, with severe loss of ecosystem services, which is also a topic that is very interesting for us and that we should be um, <clears throat> looking for. Um, in, in more detail, and I'm probably going to outline a few ideas here, to wildfires in North America, but elsewhere. So, all, you know, with all this complexity, uh, we are expecting, for example, there are some estimations that indicate that by 2050, we'll be having around 17 million climate migrants in the Americas, in Latin America and the Caribbean alone. So that um, also sets the tone a little bit of the challenges that health um, systems will face and are facing now as climate change hits the region. And a little bit about health infrastructure and services, also trying to raise specific attention to that and maybe we can discuss later and uh, I hope that you take that into consideration as part of the elements that, are, that, that need attention for research and, and interventions. Uh, so not only health sector contributes a lot to climate change, so there is an opportunity there to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and um, uh, on mitigation aspects. Um, most of it comes from the supply chain, but also around a third comes from hospitals and which are very energy intensive units, but very crucial uh, units that need to be up and running during or soon after or well, before as well disasters and, um, and so everything that critically impacts infrastructure uh, has to cut our, uh, catch our attention on, on, on some work to be done. And healthcare facilities represent 70% of the Ministries of Health budget. And in the region of the Americas, Latin America and the Caribbean, 77% of healthcare facilities are located in disaster prone areas. So they are vulnerable, specifically vulnerable to disasters. And, um, but not only because of disasters, ironically, but also because uh, they already lack uh, infrastructure and services to be uh, delivering the highest attainable health conditions for the population. So there are deficiencies in water and sanitation and hygiene services 
that uh, we need to address as well. I think that, I mean, uh, this picture is, is very representative of, of the time that you're living, uh, that there are, you know, there are no competing elements. Uh, all, all these, um, these topics, as you can see here, uh, reference to COVID, uh, but also, you know, in, in one of the wildfires in, that hit California last year. So as you can see, um, we are facing enormous challenges. Everywhere that we look, we have challenges and uh, we need to focus our attention and on addressing those in, in conjunction as much as possible. So having um, solutions that address the vulnerability of health systems are a way of addressing some of the existing and future problems from climate change, future potential future pandemics, and other epidemics that, that might hit us. So this is very quickly just uh, the connections of climate change can cause direct impacts on health or indirect through natural systems or socioeconomic systems. And the response of health systems could be through social and behavioral context on education and, uh, and also influencing some decision-making processes there, but also on improving health system conditions. And those two elements can reduce the vulnerability of health systems, reducing thus reducing the um, health impacts, but also health, as I mentioned before, has a role to play in cutting the strings on the top of this image. Uh, so um, with mitigation actions, so to reduce the climate impacts on health. Um, so now coming to a second part of my presentation. So this, is, this was just like a general overview on climate change and health in the Americas. I didn't want to, to give you a lot of data, but just to a brief insights on some of the problems that we face, but also now coming, coming to a second part of the presentation is a little bit on what countries are demanding from us. So how countries perceive the impacts of climate change and health. And when I say countries, I'm, I'm mentioning, I'm referring mostly to ministries of health, but also ministers of health are engaging with other ministries in their countries and providing this feedback to us. So a lot of what I'm going to present here is part of either PAHO's work, but as a response to mandates and demands that countries are giving PAHO and, and the World Health Organization. So some of the main mandates that we do have and specific ones on climate change and health uh, were part of the efforts that we, we took with Caribbean countries. Uh, so working with directly with ministers of health, ministers of environment, ministers of climate change when they exist and other ministries as well as economics and uh, or finance and, and others, agriculture and infrastructure. So we prepared with those countries a Caribbean action plan on health and climate change. So there you can find specific indicators that the countries are perceiving as important and they want to, um, to, to take action on, and also some indicators of progress um, of the implementation of this plan. We also did something similar with the Andean, in the Andean region and Mercosur, so in the Southern South America. But you always have the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreements and everything that is related with UNFCCC as our main references as a work because countries have already committed to those uh, important global movements and uh, we should not lose sight of that when we are working with countries to implement those actions. And just a little bit on the, so what are the mandates that we receive from countries and requests from countries that, that can set a little bit of the tone of uh, the interventions here and also to influence um, uh, research, but not only research, but also you know, uh, implementation programs and actions. Um, on governance and institutional structures, we do have, and I'm going to present a little bit on that, some deficiencies on making sure that health sector is sitting at the table of the decision makers, preparing plans, strategies at the national and some national levels in countries in the Americas which addresses the second part on planning that you can see here. I don't know if you can see my the arrow, my cursor, yeah. So on health infrastructure and services, we do have a lot of interest on learning from countries, what are the carbon, if they have carbon emission assessments and mitigation actions associated with that, 
because like I said, around four to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions come from actions that are under the Ministry of Health responsibility. So there's a clear role to play there. And uh, we feel that it's still um, um, not fully implemented in countries in the Americas. Not only at, in the hospital side, in the healthcare facility side, but also as sustainable procurement, because ministers of health are, have large budgets and, and may work on that to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in those activities as well. Uh, in, in the health and climate surveillance systems or integrated surveillance systems, that's where we think that research can play a large role. I'm going to present some of the country's perspectives on that, what they're requesting us to develop. And I hope that that can help to steer the discussions here. On the health co-benefits is also somehow linked with the health and climate change surveillance systems, but with a specific focus on um, what are the, uh, using the health co-benefits lenses to prioritize actions and policies in countries. So taking climate action, but also measuring health co-benefits and then um, deciding for the ones that are going to promote health are one of the uh, possibilities there. On research and capacity building, there are a number of materials and requests from countries. I'm going to quickly address that. And on health and climate financing, there is a big gap on funding for health systems to become more resilient. And that's where I want also to raise attention to. So all of that is PAHO and WHO somehow uh, agenda for implementation on this topic, but it's also should be aligned with the WHO manifesto for a healthy recovery, health, healthy and green recovery from COVID-19. So addressing six main pillars, I invite you to, uh, to visit this document if you haven't so far. Um, so protect and preserve nature, which is the source of human health. So there's a lot of potential there with the One Health approach, as some of you mentioned in, um, in the Slido um, survey that we did in the beginning. Uh, invest in essential services, for example, water sanitation and clean energy in healthcare facilities. Uh, transition quickly and uh, to uh, healthy energy sources, also promoting health and sustainable food systems, building healthy and livable cities and stop funding pollution. So on the normative sides as well, uh, if we can focus on that, it's also a possible intervention that we would like to see. So now coming specifically to the, some responses of the countries and as the responses of the survey that we had. So this is about the National Climate Change Committees, uh, if they exist in countries in the Americas. And as you can see, health is included today in most of the country's national climate change committees, which is good. It was one of the first actions that PAHO took to work with countries to make sure that health is sitting at the table. But as we are gonna see in the further questions, and this is referring to the NDCs, most countries have included health, at least mentions of health, in their nationally determined contribution, which as you know, is the main commitments that countries are making with UNFCCC. Now we are in the round of um, updated, um, and are as called enhanced NDCs. So we are still to see uh, how health is reflected in those 18. So 18 countries in the America so far had submitted the second NDC. Then, that's where the problem starts. So um, if countries, I mean, countries have or are preparing their national adaptation plans, although then we start to see some gaps there, not all countries have prepared their national adaptation plans. Yeah. When it comes to including health or not in those national adaptation plans, then we start to have some mixed messages here and there. Some countries are including health very strongly. Some countries are not including health elements or maybe just including health in the intro part as part of the main setting the scene part, but not as specific actions. And if we ask countries about health vulnerability and adaptation assessments on health, then we see that there's a still a very, very large gap to fill because not all countries or most countries don't even have those specific health vulnerability and adaptation assessments done 
at the national level, let alone subnational level, and that is hindering the implementation uh, processes that goes alongside with these diagnostics. So we do need more action on that. On the health and climate surveillance system, so the, the, the main idea is to have environmental information systems with health and surveillance, climate information systems, and social demographic information systems to start preparing early warning systems, risk communication, and action with um, uh, multiple audiences. We do have some, um, some uh, products on that on, as health and climate bulletins, but they're still far from what we think that they could look like in the end to inform health systems to take specific actions. Uh, and those are the main topics that countries are raising in the region of the Americas on what they would like to see developed as early warning systems or training processes. As you can see, almost everything is here is high in a way, right? So uh, disasters, vector-borne diseases, waterborne diseases, food and safety and security, air pollution, heat, uh, even allergies and, and these NCDs and mental health aspects. So either way, we will have some audience that are waiting to have projects on, but maybe we can focus on a few of them. The Belmont Forum has decided on some of them in the, er in the first round, and maybe now we can tweak a little bit some of these processes. As health infrastructure and services, there are Plenty of opportunities I already mentioned there. PAHO has a smart hospitals program, but we do need, we, we know that we have other partners uh, that are working on that and we do need to strengthen that area as well. This is just a, a little bit of advertising on one of PAHO's products and WHO, which are the country profiles. So I invite you to take a look at that if you wanna know what countries are in detail requesting the international um, agencies to, to work on as, PAHO, as health and climate change. We're not going to address that in a lot of detail. We do have a big call from countries to develop specific products for health professionals. And that's also something that we had prepare a pocketbook, climate change for health professionals. This is available in four languages in the Americas and um, that can give you some ideas, but we do need more tailored products for health professionals uh, as well. And on measuring the health co-benefits, just to go to my last slides, we do have uh, a good opportunity there to work not only at the national level, but also at subnational level. So provincial, state, or uh, uh, city level on air quality, on green spaces, active transportation, so investments in infrastructure, and how does that translate to health indicators is one of the things that we'd like to see reflected in uh, some of the research that uh, Belmont Forum can stimulate. So on green spaces and health, we are preparing a tool that should be available soon for the countries in the region that addresses with GIS um, systems to see what if I remove a green space in my city, or if I add a green space to my city, what are the health co-benefits associated with that as mental health, morbidity and mortality due to cardiovascular diseases because of uh, increased uh, possibilities of physical activity and type two diabetes and others, as well as noise reduction, mental health. So we do have some elements on that. Uh, this is also a very interesting approach that I think that is growing to have park prescription programs. We do have a partnership with US National Park Service here in the US and we are trying to promote that in Colombia and other countries to measure the um, health benefits of prescribing time in green spaces or in nature. I think that that would be a tremendous advancement if we could explore these, um, these possibilities as well on the health economic assessment for walking and cycling. So on active transportation, it's also something that the cities are raising as an important issue. And uh, we might explore as well as um, to measure the progress on that. And on air pollution, of course, there's uh, many possibilities that we should uh, start exploring. Health and financing, I'm not going to address a lot of that, but we do see a large gap of funding so ministers of health are not receiving or are not allocating funds 
national funds for specific climate and health programs. And internationally, less than half percent of the funds that have been approved by multilateral, multilateral organizations explicitly address health. Probably because we are not having the plans, programs, and actions on health, so they are not informing programs and interventions on health yet. Uh, but we can discuss that later. What are the gaps? And PAHO now, as a delivery partner for the Green Climate Fund, we are preparing proposals and working directly with countries to make sure that they are ready. Ministers of Health are ready to engage in the climate global climate financing processes. We do have some guidelines, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. And just to call your attention on a pledge that uh, WHO and UNFCCC are asking for countries for this next COP. So co country commitments to build climate resilient and sustainable health system to prepare VNAs, to prepare HNAPs, the health national adaptation plans, and to use this information for to improve the climate financing part for the implementation of those plans, but also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from health sector, measure and reduce. So those are pledges at the country level that can also, in a way, steer our discussions here as this is going, this is something that WHO and UNFCCC are seeking a global collaboration to. So thanks That's a lot fantastic. Yeah. For, for the opportunity, Julie, and I look forward to, to engage with you in the discussions in this forum. Thank you. No, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Booth, Daniel. Um, great, great stage setting for us all. And you actually covered almost everything. So I'm not sure how helpful it was because everything is still a need, but, um, but I loved that you had some percentages of priorities and um, everything from, you know, the green RX I actually didn't know about that, which is fantastic to, um, you know, capacity building and training priorities and a lot of tools already there. So um, first, let me thank you for your time and for that very thoughtful kind of comprehensive lay of the land. Um, and also to say that moving forward in this idea of Belmont Forum Innovative Partnerships, WHO and PAHO have said, yes, we're, we're in. We don't know what that means exactly. You know, is it just getting ministries of health engaged? And the same for WMO, World Meteorological Organization. Um, they've said the same thing. Well, we're, we're, we're in. What does that mean to be in? So we're still figuring it out. So, um, but I think even just having that um, imprimatur from those organizations is going to be helpful and the connections and the concepts and really, you know, you're, you've turned out, I'm sure a lot of the ministries of health and folks are here because you've reached out and wouldn't come just for somebody from, you know, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, maybe. So thank you very much. Um, I think we are, we are, I know we are a bit out of time or over time, but we also started a little late. So we've kind of given a little slack and we're going to take it up in two places. We're going to skip the little break and we're going to go now to um, the breakout rooms. And so Daniel, thank you again so much. And I know I had a bunch of questions and I almost wish we just opened the floor, but we're going to go to breaks instead so we can hear from everybody. And I'm going to turn it over to Anna Watson to kind of give us a charge for the breakouts. But I know that in one of my slides, if, uh, if we have time to pull it up, but we have three breakout questions and the rooms are gonna be English and Spanish and all rooms are gonna address the same three questions. So your goal is to just make sure you're in a breakout room. <laughs> and if you end up in the main space, we'll assign you one. So if you can't figure out what to do, just stay here and we'll take care of you after we get everybody all shuffled off. Anna Watson, would you like to help us with any housekeeping issues? And again, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for your time and a great presentation to get us started. Much appreciated. Thank you, Yuri, and thanks to everybody. I will launch the breakout rooms. I have assigned you based on your preferred language. All the breakout rooms will have to address the same questions and discuss and talk about the same questions. We have a great uh, collaboration from our moderators from different institutions. Um, so I will just launch the link. You just need to click on join. And let me just say, if you have not assigned yourself, if you came in late, because I know some of you didn't get the registration link, you need to put ENG or SPA in front of your name so that we can assign you. And then if you still are in the main room, we'll assign you after that. But please go rename yourself if you have not already done so. That will help. Also, you're able to come back to the main room and join us in the main room. So we, if you have any technical issue or something, I will be here to guide you through the work again to the breakup rooms. 
So we should all be being shuffled off to breakout rooms now, right, Anna? Right. You have received the, the, the join here. I see people leaving. Okay, that's a good thing. As long as they come back. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for all of your contributions over the last 45 minutes. I know that was fast and furious, and we are very grateful for all of it, especially for the tremendous work done by the moderators, Irene Torres, Science Policy Advisor to the IAI, Amanda Susser, Science Advisor to the IAI, Mercy Borbor, faculty member at the Escuela Superior Politécnica Litoral, and David Smith, faculty member at the University of West Indies Mona campus. Thank you to all of the moderators and the and also Elena Chapman from, uh, from NASA, as well as all of our note takers who are in all of the rooms. Uh, Monica, I, I believe Megan, Ayudame a acordar Daniel, uh, Kim, who else am I missing? Apologies, I, my brain is not pulling everyone together, but thank you so much for everybody. And I see Julie is back on as well. So let's transition to the Slido. Yeah. Thank you for thanking everybody. <laughs> yeah, there were so many and I can't even, um, you know, we were making the list and um, it took a, it, literally it took a, a, a village to make this happen. So, yeah, and uh, for those of you who are really just, um, what well, we've got a few minutes left, just, uh, make sure that you do the survey. And if you haven't, let us know how to reach you because there will be some follow on here. Um, you're, you're, it's a little bit like the, if you know the movie, I mean, the song, The Hotel California, you've signed up. We, we're not gonna let you go quite yet, even after this meeting, so, yeah. And also Shweta and Alice were in the English rooms. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bueno, okay. para retomar y finalizar, Eh, estamos proyectando un slide para que todos puedan contribuir en la discusión. So based, uh, I just wanted to remind you if you go to, if you want to listen this presentation in Spanish, please use the translation option. We have our interpreter in the room. Um, also, please, if you can join slido.com with the code 122442 or just take a picture with your phone on the QR code that it's on the on your screen. You can send your ideas of based on your discussions. What should be the funding priorities for climate, environment, and health in the Americas? Okay, research in local context, early warning system, vulnerabilities, integrated database. Funding beyond borders. So that's a good one. Yeah, more, more collaborations are grow across transboundary issues. That's something, something important. Knowledge, knowledge. Oh, vulnerabilities. That's a that's um one that is receiving a lot of attention from the attendees. Urban settings. One health. Analytical methods. Databases. Research in local context inequities. Okay, Anna, for some reason your screen isn't updating, at least for me. Maybe you can refresh it. Yeah. Can you see it now? No. No. no but I, I see it on my phone. On the phone, it's working really well. On the screen, it just says, what, well, inversión en estudios. Yeah. On the yeah. actual slide, we can see it, though. Yeah. And we'll capture it regardless. So even though it's not loading right here, um, we're seeing it on our phones. See? <laughs> Integrated databases is kind of in the middle, though. That's it's the common piece, but it wasn't. It's the piece I heard throughout, but it isn't the. It's like the underpinning. I think it's not. You know, fund integrated databases just in and of their own selves, right? 
Oh, there you go. An update. Thank okay. you. All right. So we we still have one question mark, and that's connected with training. So please, if you can send your preference for training in, in about the nexus of climate, environment, and health, what kind of training priorities do you think are important to address those nexus in Latin America and the Caribbean? Okay, I got environmental education, climate services and health, scientific communication, occupational safety, research, special databases, awareness across sectors, co-creation, -co stakeholders, data analysis, special epidemiology, <laughs> no more Zoom. I couldn't agree more. We need something more um, face to face. Um, so, well, thank you, everybody. You can still keep uh, sending your um, your answers to our poll. I will give the floor to Yuli and Anna. All right. Um, please do keep filling out the Slido and. Uh, and we'll, we'll probably like, I can see already the report that our AI is gonna do is gonna have like word clouds, you know, at the, at the beginning of it or something. So, but it really, it really does help us understand um, sort of how our thinking has shifted after the two hours and what some of the priorities are. It's a quick way of doing that assessment. So um, while it was supposed to be engaging, it's actually really informative for us too. So please keep filling that out. And um, thank you all for your time and effort um, to, to the breakouts were amazing. The two I was in were just cranking on it. So thank you all so much. Um, Anna and I have the hard job of, of synthesizing a little bit and doing some next steps. So I'm just going to start with a few of the key highlights that I heard um, from the breakouts. What will happen is that we'll put this into a document. IAI has very generously um, offered to help write a white paper or maybe more um, that helps synthesize the research from this and a couple of other conversations that are happening over the next couple of weeks. So um, just so you know uh, that this will have legs beyond just this, this particular meeting. So a couple of the things that were um, interesting for me and Anna, I'll do like a minute or two and then let you go and then we'll just do some logistics and next steps. But I heard in both groups um, really address some of the chronic challenges and more of the, the true environmental effects on health. So just health and well-being, the parks, uh, the green space, and really understanding how uh, the connection between our environmental health and personal health, which is kind of, you know, basis of the One Health context, which quite frankly, that's what I do, but I wasn't expecting to hear so much of that in both of those sessions. It was very evident. I was pleasantly surprised, so probably why I chose to, to pick up on that. Um, and also the, um, yeah, the, um, the ability to, to share data, um, not just integrate data, but to access of data and a, a, a usually health data. I almost don't even want to say that because it's, it's always an issue of data, temporal and spatial scale and access, but I think it is, it is a hindrance. So we've got to figure that out how to do that. Um, the health effects of interventions and the co-benefits of things that maybe from other sectors, not the health sector, but thinking about transportation and energy subsidies and the co-benefits and the health benefits of that. Um, and uh, there was also a discussion about um, the translators and really investing in how, you know, it started with common language and how do you do that? You can't just like build a glossary, right? You have to build the partnerships and building trust that takes funding and it takes time and it takes people who are skilled at going across disciplines and translating. So that was a, that was a big piece to, to be important. And then the last one was, um, was really, you know, none of them were, were topic specific actually. Yeah. The other one was really looking at, um, underserved populations and the inclusion, how do we more innovatively include and honestly co-produce, you know, traditional knowledge, um, underserved populations. We didn't tackle any particular population head on, but that that was a gap in at least how we were framing it and no specific recommendations of how to do it. But that was that was that was something that was raised also in at least one in both groups, actually. So 
those were some highlights for me. And the big picture, longer term challenges balanced with the short term acute, you know, we do need to do a better job of connecting our health professionals and our met services and climate services so that we can do something now and in the out years, but also planning for the long term environmental changes and parks and green space and stuff. That was actually um, a nice continuum. So I don't know, what did you hear the, in your groups? Well, I'm going to synthesize also some of the highlights that have been shared by our moderators and beginning with issues of scale and data um, that came up in several of the groups related to data collection, and data sharing and the need for multi-country initiatives to be able to bring together climate, environment, and health data in a way that, that can actually be integrated and analyzed and also capacity gaps and capacity limitations to be able to analyze and bring those data streams together. Other colleagues mentioned the lack of political will that limited some of the connectivity and interlinkages between science society and the policy makers and difficulties of recognize, rec recognizing um, health, uh, cl sorry, climate as a health issue by doctors. So the medical professionals are not yet recognizing and naming climate as a health challenge. Other colleagues also mentioned challenges with having top-down or sort of one-size-fits-all solutions and the need for, again, working with local communities um, and how that is challenging also when both the research and the decision-making remain siloed and driven from the top down. And finally, one of the groups really highlighted the need to have underrepresented Indigenous groups at the core of the stakeholder group. I thought that was a really important observation. So. There's a lot more that came out of this conversation, but those were a few initial thoughts from what I saw. So I really thank you. Thank all the moderators and note takers for their contributions and all of you who participated and made this possible. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I, I just wanna say a couple of things. Um, thank you for for everybody's thoughts. And also, you know, the follow-up here, we. we we do have your emails. We are we are doing a scoping. So just as the, because this was the America scoping doesn't mean that's the only one you can participate. We will use and let you know open the the involvement to the other regions scoping to you as well. Um, if you are interested in um, follow up, uh, we will will give you a chance. You know, we'll send an email out with a you know thank you for attending. And if you want uh, to be involved, or if you know of other funders that you are interested, you know, because remember, go back to the beginning, we can shape the best program in the world, but unless you have people who can fund uh, the work, uh, then, you know, nothing, nothing gets funded. So help us find the partners. It can be dollars, it can be in kind, it can be labs, it can be like PAHO and WMO, you know, institutional collaboration. One of the things that came up was a mandate and organizational will. Um, so we've got to overcome that as well. Uh, and I think for that, I will just actually turn it back to you, Anna, and see if there's any engagement that you would like to have just in the Americas. IAI has been absolutely amazingly gracious with leading this first kickoff in the Americas and being a part of our, you know, Belmont Forum CEH scoping. So thank you and the IAI team and cohort of everybody, um, US GCRP and um, Amerigeo. We purposely set this within Amerigeo context because we really wanted to help bridge that gap with health professionals and earth ops folks. So um, we want to continue that. We do have your email. Uh, we'll have a follow on for further engagement and we won't pester you forever, but uh, we will give you a chance to be engaged. And if you are really interested in further information or have questions, please, feel free, actually, I will look for the last, you know, somebody who has a slide, can you put the email contact and then I'll turn it over to you, Anna, for um, final closing words. Wish Anna, Julie. Anna Stewart. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Just to mention to everyone, uh, we're right at the end of our time here, but the your input will be used to inform uh, IAI's upcoming efforts to develop capacity building around climate, environment, and health in the coming year. And those will be regional training workshops uh, in person and virtually, hopefully in person. And so uh, sort of keep your eyes and ears open for those opportunities. And again, your input will shape those priorities. Um, Anna Watson, I believe we will be sending follow-up email to all of you with a survey 
that you can add your demographic information. And also, can we add the Slido links to that email that goes out so those who are not able to contribute with ideas about funding and training, can they add it afterwards as well? Yeah. Yes, you will receive an email with a survey uh, for all the participants, also the materials from today. Well, the, hopefully the presentations and the recording of the first part of the session and with uh, Daniel Bass presentation. Can they still contribute the to the Slido questions about funding and training priorities? Yes, they will be able to uh, keep contributing with the words clouds for, for us to register your opinions there. Excellent. And in the next month or so, we will be working internally to synthesize the information we've gathered from you all. And we will share that document back with you. So there will be a period of, that we will open for comments. Uh, and we really look forward to your feedback. And again, this no, is actually, oh, Anna, one thing we have the September 7th, um, Ameri the uh, uh, geo health community practice uh, further deep dive in the Americas. And we do earth OBS and health in that session. So if you are interested and have stuff that you would like to say or raise or whatever, you feel free to join us to for that session as well. Um, it's not an official conduit to this. This is kind of an official stream, but please feel free to come and raise Anything that you would like to raise scientifically or institutionally, the September 7th and the 21st, we're doing two sessions just focused on the America's climate, environment, and health stuff. So um, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have had, had that up a bit earlier, but thank you, Anna. Thank you, Julie. And Anna, you wanna close with the screenshot? Yeah. You can't, we sorry, can't. it was me, okay. no, it's almost a year. Yeah, so. Yeah, if you want to join for a final picture, we're going to take some screenshots. Lucia, can you please help us with that? And maybe we can say... Perfect. Um, <laughs> the age? I don't know. <laughs> we have my camera. It's, it's not the same as the big meeting picture, but we're doing this we can in this virtual environment. So um, while you're turning your cameras on, let me just thank everybody again from the, from the organizers, the moderators, the, the Belmont Forum, CEH team, um, and all of you. So, and Daniel, uh, Boos, and Pajo, you know, you're paving the way for this integration here with the WHO engagement and Pajo engagement. So uh, really much gratitude for, for that connection. Um, all right, you guys taking pictures? Are you gonna give us a countdown so everyone knows when to smile? All right, smile on one, three, two, one. <laughs> Are we there? All right. You got it, Lucia? Thank you. Yeah, it's done. Muchas gracias. Oh, okay, all right. Well, well thank you all. Anna, yeah, you got the last word. Saludos. Thank you to everybody. Cuídense mucho, everyone. Y gracias a nuestros traductores. Eh, sin ustedes Muchas no gracias, gracias por la invitación. Feliz día. Gracias, gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por participar. Gracias, gracias. Soledad. Gracias. 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 Gracias a todos. Chao.